Elysimonin A isn't just every armchair chemist's dream. It also belongs to a class of natural products with very intriguing bioactivities, such as causing exceptional growth of nerve cells. This means the study of these molecules might help unlock new treatments for neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. After we check out this unique molecule's isolation and properties, we will study not one, but two sophisticated syntheses. Be warned that this will be very advanced chemistry. I'm sure you all know the pain of sign errors from maths. Well, we will also see that even great scientists sometimes make weird mistakes. The discovery reads like any other painful natural product story. Starting from a random rare anise tree used historically as folk medicine, various isolation efforts were looking to discover new interesting terpenoids. This was surely great fun, mashing up 96 kilograms of fruits, extracting three times with 220 liters of ethanol, and subjecting the 16 kilograms of extract to a dozen purification steps, to ultimately isolate whopping 4 milligrams of product. To characterize this new molecule and its relative stereochemistry, the chemists performed in-depth NMR analysis, reflected in them drawing as many correlation arrows as they could fit on one page. The absolute configuration, so the question of which enantiomer we were dealing with, was determined by estimating circular dichroism spectra computationally via DFT and then selecting the enantiomer with the best fit of theoretical to natural. Remember this point for later. The nice effect we saw on outgrowth promoting activity of neurites was actually from another molecule found in Elysium trees. This molecule was discovered 8 years earlier by a Japanese research group and has seen a lot of attention from synthetic chemists due to its complexity and effects. What about our beloved Elysimonin A? Well, here the researchers tested something different, most likely because the neurite growth wasn't there with this molecule. Instead, they took a human brain-derived cell line and subjected the culture to glucose deprivation and hypoxia, or lack of oxygen. Essentially, really unpleasant growing conditions for the cells. You can see that while untreated oxygen and glucose deprived cells in red had more than 50% lower optical density than the green control, the effect wasn't so bad on cells that were treated with elysimonin A. For example, at a 40 micromolar concentration, roughly 80% of the damage was prevented. So all in all, not a noble price in terms of discovery, but definitely interesting for further investigations and reason enough for organic chemists to spend several years on a synthesis. As a side note, consider becoming a member or Patreon if you like my videos and want to support the channel. So this thing is pretty cool, but how do we make it? Despite several research groups attempting its synthesis, only two have been published to date. Both of them take a similar approach, tracing back Elysimonin A to such an intermediate. I added some colors to help you compare. Do you have any ideas on what steps might be used here? And why the heck would we plan with such an intermediate with a completely different ring system? The first or actually final step is a directed CH oxidation, a method commonly used in the synthesis of this family of highly oxygenated natural products, forming the lactone from the carboxylic acid. This way, if realistic, would be more elegant than the alternative of introducing a hydroxyl group at this carbon and linking it with an activated ester. It's quite important that the pink hydrogen is the only accessible site for the acid-directed CH oxidation, as all other carbons are already substituted. That hydrogen is however doubly neopentylic, or in other words very sterically hindered, so this step might be quite challenging. After the first retrosynthetic disconnection, some functional group interconversions on the top and bottom parts then can lead to this type of ketone. This directly links to the six-membered ring intermediate we just saw earlier via a semi-pinnacle rearrangement of a tertiary alcohol and an epoxide. The rationale behind this is that the transfused pentaline system present in the natural product is very strained, meaning that it would be likely quite challenging to create the setup via a direct cyclization. In such cases, rearrangements and ring contractions can be very useful, offering a sneaky backdoor entry into strained systems. And to be honest, the team probably tried seven other ways to create the system and ultimately this approach worked. So both published syntheses use this type of intermediate, and we will check out their detailed forward synthesis right now. 
Rychnowski and team published the molecule's first synthesis in 2019. I hope you can forgive me not spending 9 hours redrawing structures and arrows in ChemDraw. There are obviously quite a few things happening with each step, so feel free to pause and think about mechanisms or selectivity of the reactions. The synthesis started with this symmetric diketone, which was captured as an enol ether and then subjected to an aldol reaction with this ketone here. The aldol product, a beta hydroxy ketone, was then converted into another silyl enol ether with dimethyl chlorosilane, which created a very electron rich diene system. This led to a direct intramolecular Diels Alder reaction, creating two rings and five stereocenters in a single step. If you want a quite easy but not overwhelming exercise, you can think about the diastereoselectivity at all the different carbons. So now the ester served its purpose as an activating group on the dienophile, so they reduced and protected it next. Because lithium aluminum hydride also reduced the ketone, they reoxidized it back. This is where most of the remaining steps took place. You might remember that we want an epoxide for the ring rearrangement, but also a methyl carboxyl group for the final lactone. Because numerous different methods to introduce that missing carbon-11 didn't work, they had to resort to a weird sequence consisting of vinyl iodide formation, nucleophilic addition to DMF and reduction. All in all, this replaced the ketone with a hydroxyl methyl group. Lastly, they epoxidized the olefin with quite obvious diastereoselectivity. This brings us to the pivotal step and the key intermediate we talked about in the retrosynthesis. By adding some acid, the liberated alcohol at C7 triggered the semi-pinnacle rearrangement, leading to the migration of the original C5 to C7 bond. This corresponds to a contraction of the 6 to the 5 membered ring. The stereochemistry stays the same, so the selectivity is also obvious. The end game consisted of just a few more steps. First, conversion of the primary alcohol to the acid in the top part, as well as formation of the hemiacetal in the lower part. To the team's delight, the final CH oxidation didn't require much optimization and delivered the final product even despite high steric demands. This synthesis was only racemic, so the team created both enantiomers of Elysimone and A. To confirm its absolute configuration, the team separated the enantiomers at the allylic alcohol step by a column separation of derivatized diastereomers 26 and 27. Even though 27 was the supposedly incorrect diastereomer, when they carried it to the final product, it was shown to match the experimental CD spectrum. How is this possible? Remember that the team matched the configuration based on computed spectra. And because the red curve corresponding to the wrong enantiomer matched the black experimental line better, they thought it's that one. However, when Rychnowski and team computed the red curve on their own, it looked more like the blue one. Basically, the first team effed up and assigned the wrong stereochemistry. They are forgiven though as they are not computational chemists and rather masters at their own craft, which happens to be isolating 4 mg of a random molecule from 90 kg of fruits. The structure revision made much more sense as well, considering other related natural products such as the anise lactones have the same configuration at C1. Now that we've confirmed the stereochemistry, you might be wondering why would anyone even care about additional syntheses beyond the first one? Well, a few years ago, Kalesi and co-workers reported a complex nazarov in tandem reaction, which creates a spirocenter and various stereocenters simply based on the configuration of this hydroxyl group. They realized that this method could be nicely applied to an asymmetric synthesis of Elysimone in A. To get there, they also wanted to leverage the previously established semi-pinnacle rearrangement. If you want a challenging retrosynthetic exercise, you can think about how you would link this target intermediate to the Nazarov in product. We will directly dive into how they did it. Their starting material was this chiral propergylic alcohol, available in 3 steps with 91% EE. So that's why their synthesis is asymmetric. The first step was a nickel catalyzed hydrocyanation, proceeding with excellent Markovnikov selectivity. Because the nitrile group was not that reactive in the upcoming interconversions and required harsher conditions, they had to protect the tertiary alcohol here as well. After reducing the nitrile to the aldehyde, an organolithium addition and a reoxidation created the Nazarov precursor. 
We've already seen how this one works. Upon addition of a Lewis acid, an electrocyclization creates the first five-membered ring, which does not just deprotonate to get to a normal Nazarov product, but rather is intercepted by an in reaction. It was important to protect the beta-hydroxy group as they found upon scale-up, a retroaldol pathway led to significant decomposition of the product. Unfortunately, this is where it becomes quite tricky. While the tandem reaction nicely built up the framework, several steps were needed to refunctionalize it to the pinnacle precursor. Remember again that we need the carboxylic acid in this position, requiring a one carbon extension. Similar to the first synthesis, one two additions of nucleophiles or olefinations failed, requiring the team to take a detour. The first step was an alpha hydroxylation, which allowed them to introduce this weird silyl ether. This was very clever, as the protonation of the most acidic proton next to the silicon allowed for intramolecular addition to the ketone without any side reactions. With this, they linked a new carbon to C10. To get rid of the silyl ether, they managed to cleave the silicon oxygen bond via methylation, however, with an interesting divergent solvent and ion effect. In all cases, the bond cleavage occurred with subsequent intramolecular chloride substitution. Using a methyl magnesium reagent, they cleanly got this epoxide. On the other hand, methyl lithium in THF at lower temperatures gave the oxetane ring. You can see from their supporting information that they attempted very precise temperature optimization, ultimately getting best yields with minus 12 degrees Celsius and having to use explicit temperature control. Now the system was converted to an unsaturated aldehyde through acid-mediated epoxide opening. So all of this was necessary to just introduce a new carbon at C11. But conveniently, this also introduced a double bond, which enabled allylic oxidation to functionalize C7. To manage side reactions, they reduced the aldehyde and masked both alcohols with a bidentate protecting group. The allylic oxidation was very tricky as well. As you can see from their SI, they had to screen various agents to ultimately discover that use of a chromium-5 complex over four regeneration steps was the only decent way to progress. Only one key step was needed to get to the pinnacle precursor, a radical cyclization between the ketone at C7 and the C5 olefin via a ketyl radical. As you can see in this visual, all cyclization substrates they studied led to undesired stereoselectivity highlighted in red. This might be due to minimization of steric interactions, with the bigger group preferring an orientation that is syn to the hydrogen at the cyclopentane ring. The green conditions with titanium-3 were the best result they got, so that's what they proceeded with. The resulting diastereomers were not separable, so they just went on with alcohol protection and epoxidation using the mixture of both. Funnily, but also sadly, the semi-pinnacle rearrangement of this slightly different intermediate did not work when they used TFA as a Bronsted acid like Rychnovsky. Rather, they had to use tin tetrachloride as a Lewis acid to affect the transformation. The rearrangement proceeded in over 90% yield based on the desired diastereomer and they were finally able to isolate it. The last steps are straightforward if you remember the first synthesis. Oxidation of the carboxylic acid and hemiacetal formation and finally the CH oxidation to create enantiopure minus lysimonin A. As a final verdict on the configuration, this product matched the natural CD curve with a negative sign at 215 nanometers, further confirming that Rychnovsky's structural revision was correct. So this second synthesis started out very efficiently, but was one hell of a ride. Even though it is quite lengthy, it demonstrates some nice methods and reaction optimization, providing valuable lessons for other chemists in future. What did you think? If you like this video, consider becoming a channel member and activate notifications for future videos. Thanks for watching and see you next time.